afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, or welcome back to our webinars, to the second series of COVID-19 webinars presented by the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Today, uh, we uh, stick to our theme uh, of uh, last week uh, and focusing on digital technology. And while last week we took a look at remote consultations and their use during the pandemic, this week we focus specifically on COVID-19 apps. Um, and specifically how they were used in the pandemic, the opportunities and challenges, and how we see the future of uh, digital health beyond the pandemic once we have it behind us. Um, we have a stellar group of speakers today, and we're very uh, happy and honored to welcome them. Um, I will provide a, a brief um, introduction to the background of the, of the discussion for today, and then move quickly um, to uh, involve you as our audience um, in the way we shape the, the webinar um, and to then pass on to our uh, esteemed group of, of speakers. So as uh, all of you will have uh, discussed and read about and perhaps also decided on the past few months, um, there, are, uh, there was a, a big effort uh, to uh, use digital applications uh, under other, among other um, uses within the pandemic for contact tracing. Uh, contact tracing is an essential tool uh, in COVID-19 prevention um, and many countries uh, have been discussing and developing apps to help uh, keep an automatic record of contracts but also um, to alert those, uh, to alert the population about possible uh, COVID-19 exposure. The apps of course raised both uh, huge technical policy and ethical challenges and it often proved harder than expected technologically to design apps for this purpose, taking all of that into account. Um, there were huge privacy concerns uh, that arose around how data is collected, stored and used, and the necessity of using platform provided by big companies. And in practice, we see that for most countries, it was difficult um, to get uh, citizens to enroll. In practice, we see that very few um, got more than one in five residents to download the apps and usage is even uh, more challenging. And so the question for today is what can we learn from our experience with these apps for this pandemic uh, and um, in order to improve their use while we're still in it, but also the use of digital technologies overall uh, when the pandemic is over. So we're hoping for uh, um, quite a bit of uh, participation on your part uh, we already have received some questions, so we're really grateful to our participants who reached out even before the webinar. Um, as you know, you have a Q&A or a chat box um, at the bottom of your screen, which we ask you to use uh, for anything you might want to share with us and the speakers. Um, before um, I pass to the speakers, just to tell you that we won't be taking any questions between uh, inputs. So we have a keynote speaker followed by spotlights from country examples and different discussions. Um, so we, um, we ask you not to use, uh, we ask to use the, the, the chat box to ask questions if they are for a specific speaker. Um, then ask, uh, add the name of the speaker that you're asking. If not, they are open for everyone. Uh, very briefly, um, I will introduce our group of speakers today so as not to um, take any more time. So we will have a keynote from Nick Fahi uh, from the University of Oxford. Um, Nick is the uh, co-lead of the Partnerships for Health, Wealth and Innovation um, at Oxford Biomedical Research Center. Um, he is an expert um, in technologies and uh, data science and one of our colleagues at the pillar of uh, co-leads at the pillar of, uh, of the pillar of innovation at the European Observatory on Health Systems and, Systems and Policies. During the pandemic, uh, he focused his research in part um, on digital health and uh, COVID-19 apps and this is what he's going to share with us today. Then we will hear from Alexander degelsegger marcus um, who uh, comes from the Austrian Public Health Institute, Gesundheit Österreich, um, and he will share with us an example from uh, Austria. Um, and then we will hear uh, from Kerry Thompson from the European Commission how the uh, whole uh, area of contact tracing apps and digital uh, applications for COVID-19 uh, was handled at the EC level. And we will hear from, from Clayton Hamilton from the World Health Organization um, what the, his experience over the years uh, with um, IT for um, global health and public health purposes has been and how this specifically applies uh, to the pandemic in the past few months. 
Um, we, uh, after the experience of uh, a number of webinars on COVID so far, have realized that we uh, are all better off when we engage our audience as much as possible. Um, and we have been piloting now for the past two webinars the uh, tool of polls uh, to engage you a little bit more and to give our speakers also the possibility uh, to reflect on those issues that are most important to the participants um, in each particular webinar. So for today, uh, we have a, a poll question for you, and I will pass to my colleague Erica Richardson to explain the process. Erica, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Um, we're going to pose a quick question to everybody using the poll. Um, Annalisa, if you could launch the poll, that would be fantastic. Um, so just to, uh, so, so we get a, a bit of a flavour of who we've got in the audience and um, what, what's, how we sort of like uh, feel about digital health tools. We wanted to just see if you could possibly um, let us know which digital health tools have been most important in the COVID-19 pandemic so far, for, so far. You can choose more than one if you can't choose between them. Um, I'm biased, uh, but so I won't tell you that uh, I think remote patient monitoring was one of them, but because uh, I'm biased. But yes, please do um, let us know what you think and we'll let you know the results of those polls at uh, that poll um, after uh, Nick's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Dimi. Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, and uh, my thanks also for the invitation to be here today. Um, and I should also add that uh, I think all of the, the speakers today have also contributed to the work which I'm going to be talking about, as well as in particular, um, my co-author on the, the upcoming policy brief from which this material draws, uh, uh, Gemma Williams. So uh, today um, I'm going to be drawing on some material which will be published uh, by the observatory in the, uh, shortly, we hope, um, in the form of a policy brief about the use of digital health uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I'm going to talk on the basis of, uh, as you can see today, I just want to outline briefly, first of all, what we're talking about in terms of definitions just recall where we were before the pandemic, how we've assembled this information and then focus on the, the use of digital health tools and where they might be going in the future. So useful to start with definition. So what do we actually mean by digital health? Because this is an area where we've used lots of different terms over the years. We started out talking about e-healthy use of information and communication technologies to improve health. Um, and we've also had an increased focus as smartphones and mobile technologies have become ubiquitous. We've talked also a lot about M health, mobile health. We're now increasingly using this term of digital health and uh, today we're gonna to be using it in the sense of the use of digital technologies to improve health. And how is that different from either of these two? Well, it incorporates the ideas behind e health and M health, but with an additional focus on data, uh, data and the uses through which data is um, taken advantage of through things like artificial intelligence. So just a, a word about definitions at the very beginning. And I wanna just briefly talk about where we were before the pandemic. Um, so this whole topic of how we use uh, e-health, m-health, digital health technologies has been a topic for many years uh, with seen the transformational effect of these technologies on many different sectors of the economy. We've seen whole sectors of the, the economy revolutionized, and we can all see potential for these technologies to improve both the quality and the efficiency and the accessibility of health and care um, services. And there's been enormous efforts to try and achieve that. But it's worth noting that despite those efforts, the uptake obviously varies very much between different health systems and some are certainly more advanced than others. And we're in a better position at the start of the pandemic. But in many systems across Europe, we still saw relatively low uptake. And it's worth recalling why that is the nature of this challenge. It's tempting to think that the solution to the introduction of a technology is a technological solution, right? That the way in which we get more use of certain types of technologies is to make that technology better or different. Actually, 
one of the things we've seen very clearly is that the way in which we improve the use of digital technologies for health is also social and organizational and system level changes because when you change the technology you change the whole process of the system as a whole and if you don't you are unlikely to make good use of that technology so how did we look at the use of uh, these different technologies during uh, digital health tools during the pandemic we drew on the observatory's health systems policy monitor and the network of correspondence across the European region affiliated to uh, that infrastructure. We did a rapid review of the academic literature. That it's fair to say that uh, colleagues around the world have made an enormous effort and the whole academic world was making an effort to publish very rapid results about how responses to COVID-19 have been put in place. And we investigated a number of country experiences in detail and we'll be hearing more about one of those from one of the other speakers today. So let's talk a little bit about different areas of usage. Um, let's start with communication and information. So one of the first things that came across obviously was the need of different uh, systems to be able to share information about uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, and that's in a sense a fairly straightforward technology because it was building on things like websites and other communication tools uh, which were relatively straightforward. It's also interesting that some countries started to provide information that was specifically aimed at tourists, people traveling. So for example, in Spain, the Ministry of Health set up a specific web portal and a mobile app focused on tourists rather than on the resident population. Um, and uh, other tools have been used as well to try and provide information in a more active way or a more targeted way and provide enabling people to connect directly with health services. And that's partly related to this second topic, which has come across really clearly, which is not just about providing information, but about combating misinformation. This has been a real challenge. The World Health Organization has referred to what it called an infodemic of misinformation concerning COVID-19. Um, and as well as just providing information, we've begun to see an increasing use of adapted health tools like uh, digital health tools like chatbots um, or other automated uh, infrastructure, which would in other instances be used for marketing, which is being used for actively combating different types of misinformation. And that's emerged as a real theme of digital health technologies during the pandemic. On the second area of monitoring and surveillance, I think we've all talked about, we talk about these apps and um, what I think a lot of people have in mind for the apps is the proximity tracing tools. You know, you download something onto your mobile phone and it, uh, it tracks where you've been, alerts you uh, where you've, um, uh, who you might have had contact with, who might be a risk from COVID. One of the interesting things about that, Dimi already highlighted the challenges of getting people to download that in the introduction. It's also been quite clear that in practice, uh, these have been a support and a support to varying degrees to traditional contact um, tracing methods, but they absolutely have not been able to replace them. And so in some ways, the more useful tools have been the tools that support the contact tracers themselves, the response tools, the information management tools, the ability to link up different sources of information for public health staff and people who are doing that contact tracing in perhaps a more uh, traditional way. And one of the other tools, of course, has been people using apps not in that automated sense of tracking who they've been near, but providing people the tools to track their own symptoms and to test their own symptoms. And we've seen apps that have effectively been community um, generated research data where people have downloaded apps and tracked their symptoms and any tests that they've had, which has provided information about the spread of the pandemic through a whole population. It's also been really interesting to look at the provision of health services and how that's changed. I won't say a great deal about remote consultations because that was talked about in the previous webinar, but uh, the question also has arisen in the pandemic around managing patients remotely because obviously hospitals have been under enormous pressure. 
and people in any case prefer to be able to stay at home if they can. So there's been questions about how can we most effectively manage patients at home? And one of the issues has been, do we combine that with devices such as oximeters? And that's been a developing area. And then the fourth area, which of course is emerging now is the whole process of vaccination, immunity and pharmacovigilance of the process of vaccination and potentially the ideas of having digital certificates of vaccination. But again, another one of the speakers is going to talk about that in more detail. So I'm going to leave that for now. In my last 90 seconds, um, before Erica appears on my screen, um, I just want to talk about where we might go next. So the first thing is, is what do we do to actually learn from these period, this period of time and see what we want to keep as we move forward? Because it's clear that there's been an enormous uptake of digital health tools as a response to the pandemic, but it's not clear how much of this will remain as we return to a new normal and how much of this should remain because a lot of this has been done in a very ad hoc, very urgent way and what we really read, need now is rapid research to understand what has worked, what has really added value, what has been only a best available solution in the absence of normal healthcare, and therefore what we should be doing to support the uptake of digital health tools in practice. Digital health and immunity, as I say, I will, I will leave for a second. Ah, it's, it's dimming appearing on my screen instead. Um, and then the one final issue which I will leave us with is this idea of a dependence on digital infrastructure. Because we've seen, I think, in areas such as manufacturing of, uh, of vaccines or personal protective equipment that Europe has found itself dependent upon sources of supply from outside the, Europe, uh, the European region. But that's also been the case for digital infrastructure and, and we don't need to look any further than the need to effectively fall back on the infrastructure provided by Google and Apple for the contact tracing apps. And so one challenge for the future is what is the digital infrastructure that we need to be thinking about as having access to within European countries? That's a very swift overview of material, which I, as I say, I hope is going to be published in the very near future in the form of a policy brief from the observatory, but I hope Dimi that it was both informative and within the period of time allocated. And thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Nick. Perfect timing. And I think also a very, very necessary mind map of all the different types of technologies that we are talking about, perhaps, because sometimes, you know, we all talk about digital health or e-health or m-health, and we mean different things. So the discussion cannot actually move forward unless we mean the same. So I think this was very helpful, um, definitely in this respect. Um, as well as um, in teasing what the observatory will be uh, publishing soon for everyone to be excited about. Um, I think we can move now from the, from the conceptual and the bird's eye view that, that Nick provided to a specific example uh, and we go to Austria and to Alexander who is the executive, uh, who heads the executive department of digital health and innovation at the Austrian Public Health Institute. And Alex, you were also um, seconded to the Ministry of Health uh, in spring of this year. Um, as an expert in this area. So if you could give us a brief uh, glimpse into the situation in Austria, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kimi. Uh, hello to everybody from my side. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to discuss um, a few of the digital health related issues that will stay with us beyond the pandemic with this excellent group of participants and speakers. So I will indeed look a bit in detail at uh, one or two examples that we have seen in Austria and then try to return to the meta level. And I guess I could complement uh, a few of the things that Nick has so excellently outlined already. So of course the pandemic has shaken up things in digital health in Austria quite a bit. As everywhere in the area of telemedicine, for instance, we've seen a lot of movement um, in, in discussions that have been going on for ages. One other example, of course, is that we also have our story of a uh, proximity tracing app, a COVID proximity tracing app. And just to give you a few pointers, uh, the Austrian app, it's called Stop Corona app, was one of the first in the field in spring. It has um, used from the very beginning, it has opted for the decentralized approach, Bluetooth based that has become sort of uh, the standard in most uh, EU member states. 
after a few rounds, the source was also made uh, available uh, publicly. Uh, there were data protection reviews that led to refinements um, of the code. The app was uh, was was uh, publicized as, um, uh, as as voluntary. Was endorsed by the minister. And the uh, implementation and the uptake uh, cannot really be sold as a success story. So we are rather on the average uh, uptake level on on the lower end in in the European context. I think it's around 13 to 15 percent of of the population has downloaded uh, the app. We can discuss a long time about these uh, about these challenges. It it revolves around uh, communication, political communication, the um, digital health affinity of the population, of course, around the question of of uh, maybe a legal basis that might have come in uh, handy, and the question of funding. What I want to focus on in the remaining minutes, though, is is a different aspect. The interesting thing, if we look about the COVID-19 app example in Austria, is that it was developed uh, in the private slash NGO sector. It's not a public sector procurement solution. Now, there has been going on a lot of innovation also in digital health in Austria in public sector innovation proper. And the example being, for instance, the electronic vaccination pass that is being developed and that is currently also being discussed how it will be linked to uh, supranational processes regarding uh, cross-border travel, for instance. So the question of how to set up a, um, a system to uh, check not only for test results, but also vaccination status. And the ministry is doing a lot of, uh, of great work in this regard, and it's keeping uh, people busy for a while already because it's a very complex uh, matter, of course. So the difference to the COVID-19 example here is that this is, as I said, public sector innovation that's driven uh, and, and implemented by ministry stakeholders and partners. And um, what I think we can learn from uh, looking at this speeded up situation that we have sort of when, when a health innovation system gets into crisis mode, right? It, things become very compressed. You, have, you suddenly have actors proposing this COVID-19 app. They already have it in the field. They question, okay, can you endorse that? What is the legal basis? What can we do? And then you have a, a process like the electronic vaccination pass. That's a public sector innovation um process going on for a long time and suddenly it's completely revamped and it's condensed in time and it needs to be out there as soon as possible and then you have still other examples that are sort of being developed from scratch so what i think what we see here is that there is different uh, what we could call public sector innovation management functions out there right one is of course legislation that's the, the core the core business of, of of health policy here but one is also filtering so there is an amazing amount of ideas from the private sector with, with uh, innovative ideas um, pushing towards the public sector stakeholders and, and trying to find um, sort of uh, pitch their solutions. And you, you have to invest resources in, in, in filtering. You have to invest in resources in procuring of public sector innovation, in implementing or also in repurposing ongoing innovation processes in a crisis mode. So the argument I want to make here um, is that we need a previous step if we, when we come out of the pandemic. I think it would have been highly helpful to know beforehand what our innovation needs in specific situations, like a pandemic, and what innovation management function is relevant for this need. What is it that we can procure? What is it that we want to develop ourselves because it's so sensitive or it's so uh, complex to understand the legal basis for whatever reason? Um, where do we want to use demand side innovation measures? What can happen absolutely in the private market? So they have this sort of uh, reflection uh, beforehand so that things don't get so pressed and ad hoc once you're in the, in the middle of it and in the, in the heat of it. And I think I'm right at five minutes. I will stop now. Thank you very much, Alex. That was really useful. And I think you remind us uh, very importantly that we need to understand uh, where innovation comes from in order to be able to really harness its strength uh, when it's crunch time, like you said. And I'm sure uh, we'll have quite a bit to discuss about the uh, Austrian experience when we come to the Q&A um, in a little while. So thank you very much. And I think we move from this very useful um, example from Austria to the European level and we go to Kerry. Um, Kerry is the deputy head of the eHealth Wellbeing and Aging Unit in DG Connect and is working on the digital transformation in healthcare before the pandemic, of course, already, um, but now with a particular focus um, in this area. So, Kerry, um, over to you. Uh, if you can highlight for us the experience from the EC side. 
Thank you very much, Dimitri, and uh, good morning or good lunchtime to everybody uh, listening. I'm very happy to have been invited to this uh, this event. It's I think it's super relevant and super important, and it's a, it's a great panel to be with. So, of course, um, with the experience of, of COVID and, and the, in the, the interest of all the member states to start putting in place, um, developing and thinking about contact tracing and warning apps, I mean, obviously, the interest of the EU was about, um, you know, how can we make these interoperability, interoperable, and how can we get them um, uh, developing in the same direction, you know, from the perspective that simply uh, users, as they move around the European Union, should be able to rely on their national app, you know, independently where they are, and it should not stop working the moment they cross uh, a national border, because obviously the virus does not stop at that point. So the Commission worked very, very intensely with member states, uh, and then really it ratcheted up um, an existing uh, uh, network of member states, which was traditionally meeting once every six months, and moved that to meeting four times a week, um, and worked first of all on what could be the essential requirements uh, for the apps, which of course are in terms of making sure that they're effective, um, so embedded in, in, in the national epidemiological um, uh, contact tracing processes, uh, voluntary, privacy preserving, uh, and of course, um, interoperable. And so the uh, Commission worked with Member States to come out first of all with a recommendation and then to have a common toolbox so that these apps would develop in the same direction and, and ensure interoperability. And as part of this interoperability, another sort of great success really of this was the setting up in almost record time, uh, because this simply never happens at European level, of uh, an infrastructure called the European Federation Gateway Service, which um, which national apps may now and are in the process with with funding to, to connect to to really ensure there's this this interoperability of citizens moving around and so that the app keeps working. This wasn't the only digital health uh, response to the crisis. One thing that the um, Commission did very rapidly was utilize Horizon funds to set up a big um, platform, big project, working um, also with pharmaceutical companies, getting them to donate uh, molecules um, that they that they hold and storing them and, and then applying them in, um, to, applying them to high performance computing, um, and this rapidly led to candidates that were suitable for drug repurposing that could then be. Um, uh, are then available now for taking forward and taking to the market and, and other some similar findings. Uh, the Commission also worked, uh, also negotiated with uh, with mobile um, telecoms operators uh, and uh, to, 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 to receive anonymized and aggregated mobility data that then our colleagues in the um, Joint Research uh, Centre, which is a part of the European Commission, a dedicated research part, um, have fed and, and looked to see how they can use this in epidemiolo epidemiological modelling to inform a little bit about how the, how the disease is spreading, whether or not uh, social distancing measures are working, uh, and this kind of thing. And there's a link to this uh, report if you're interested in my slide. Um, the Commission also uh, used some money from another programme to, to uh, work to develop very rapidly some AI software that can support clinical staff to speed up the diagnosis of COVID-19 and introduce this in 10 hospitals across the EU and then monitoring how it's being taken up uh, by the clinical teams and they'll use these results and to feed into sort of wider implications for, for the uptake of this kind of software. And of course, uh, a lot of money behind was put behind some emergency calls for Horizon uh, to invest in digital technology, specifically around COVID, which um, which hope will, will even be relevant, of course, after COVID for other kinds of crises and community disease uh, um, uh, events. So, I mean, just then in 30 seconds, I've got uh, to tell you why we don't think this is, um, you know, flash in the pan, why we think that we're... So this, this came on top of a lot of work to really start developing you know, the legislation, the frameworks around uh, data uh, and digital health um, because of really, and so we've got a lot of um, legislation being developed, which is which is creating this framework. We've had the GDPR, of course, you're all familiar. We've had a data strategy in February. We've recently had a data governance act, which opens the door to data donation in health and care. We've got frameworks on cybersecurity. We have a, a regulation on artificial intelligence coming in March, which will look at fundamental rights and safety aspects of AI as it's being used in healthcare settings, amongst other things. We have a lot of investments planned. We have the facilities are being set up. So the supercomputing platform I mentioned was employed for COVID, but 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 in future is then available, of course, for for cancer and for diabetes and for other kind of health, important uh, health and care initiatives. We've got a lot of investments 
uh, coming um, under the next multi-annual financial framework. Just to mention the recovery and resilience facility, for example, this is over 600 billion of which 10% uh, will go on digital. And Ursula van der Leyen has mentioned not just um, about using this facility to recover from the pandemic, but to really propel Europe into the future. So um, this should be, you know, alongside the other programmes, a huge investments now that will go into to developing not just the technologies and the infrastructures, but also capacity building and health and care systems working on the skills needed, for example. And then very lastly, and just in the last 30 seconds, for the health data space then, of course, we're doing a lot of work already to develop the data that can be used for the digital technologies, whether it's electronic health records and genomics and cancer images. There is a legislative proposal planned for the end of 2021, um, which, will, which will really pick up from this generic horizontal data related uh, frameworks we're developing and really apply it specifically to the health data space. Um, and incidentally, in case you're interested, uh, people, there's a, a public consultation uh, open until the 3rd of February, and I can put the link into the chat box during the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kerry. I think that would be really useful if you can provide the link for the consultation, because as I also can see from the activity um, in the chat box, this is something that uh, our participants would definitely be interested in. I, I, I saw at least the, the topics for at least another five webinars for, uh, in, your, in your slides. It would take a while for us to go through all of that in detail. Uh, but thank you really so much. That was very, very useful. Um, let's move to Clayton um, and the WHO, and we come back to you and all our other speakers in a minute. So Clayton um, leads the Digital Health Flagship Program um, at the Division for Country Health Policies and Systems, the uh, WHO Regional Office for Europe. And Clayton, you have been providing uh, support uh, in the issues of digital health and innovation in general for health system strengthening and reform for all the countries in the region. Um, and I think you can bring us some really uh, valuable information from what the experience has been uh, during the pandemic at that level. Over to you. Thanks very much, Dimitra. So good afternoon colleagues um i hope you're all well what i'd like to do is build upon some of the conversations that we've already seen that nick has presented to give you an overview of how uh, digital technologies have been implemented in the 53 countries of the european region during the pandemic so um what we've seen very broadly is there's been an intense obvious disruption of traditional modes of healthcare provision and a lot of adoption of digital technologies in order to fill um, some urgent needs in a very short span of time. In fact, what, it, what we saw was that the pandemic itself necessitated a, what we call a dual track health systems response. That is a very focused approach on uh, delivering services for COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19 patients. And at the same time, um, <clears throat> sorry, ensuring the continuity of essential health services. The pandemic has in particular exposed significant weaknesses in a number of areas, but perhaps one of the most stark areas is in the use uh, or the ability of countries to use health information. Um, and that is the ability to have information in real time or near real time in order to uh, perform research and understanding of how COVID-19 is spreading, of the health workforce and how to best allocate resources and how to calibrate the national health system responses. That is how to form policy in order to best um, tackle uh, public health and social measures during this period. And as other speakers have mentioned, it's also accelerated the demand for digital technologies across a range of um, a range of factors. Now, what we've done here, as the epidemic began to move to Europe, we could see a lot of digital technologies being implemented within a very short period of time. And we tried to map these into six, six overarching categories, just to give them some framework, but also to see um, where the greatest um, focus of countries has been. So you can see from awareness prevention and tracking across diagnosis, diagnostics, therapeutics, to systems, to managing uh, contacts to the health system to try and stem or at least manage and mitigate the flow of individuals trying to uh, contact the health system search capacity management in uh, particularly ICU settings, the adoption of testing and research, and finally recover recovery and reestablishment. You can see some examples there. It's not an, a, an exhaustive list, but really what it's trying to illustrate is there's been an incredible diversity of how digital technologies have actually been uh, applied across the span of these different contexts. 
So today's focus is on digital contact tracing solutions. And it's been, I would dare to say, a hot topic of discussion now since the beginning of 2020. In the 53 countries of our European region, currently there are 33 live uh, contact tracing solutions in 28 countries. So the United Kingdom actually has five solutions covering its different regional uh, or different administrative divisions. We know that one, in, one country, Andorra, has one solution in the pipeline and Norway did have a solution but decommissioned it. Um, as Alexander mentioned, uh, with the Austrian solution, the majority of countries are using decentralized Bluetooth-based methodologies, the exception being the countries on the screen there. Um, and you can see that some are using GPS or a combination, others like France are using a centralized rather than a decentralized model. But certainly the pervading uh, technology adoption is decentralized Bluetooth-based. All of the solutions in Europe are optional so, uh, uh, optional, so no countries are actually mandating their use as part of contact tracing. Um, schemas. Just to illustrate, this is a, a picture of the 33 applications. So you can see that despite the fact that they actually have very different interfaces, they're all performing the same function that is uh, being able to detect uh, individuals who are at risk or who've been in close proximity contact to an individual who later confirms positive for a COVID-19 diagnosis. Currently, our office in WHO is working with the European Centre for Disease Control to try and develop develop an indicator framework to evaluate how effective these apps actually are. And it's a very difficult process to go through because of their pro privacy preserving nature. It's actually difficult to get some public health information about their performance. So this joint work is aiming to actually see what process can we actually apply in order to evaluate their effectiveness. Looking forward, as, uh, as Nick mentioned, uh, now that the, the vaccines are, are beginning to flood into the markets, the focus is now shifting towards the potential use of a, what we're calling a smart vaccination certificate. And WHO, uh, together with many partners, has picked up uh, the concept of developing uh, an open solution that can be used in any country in the world, whether it be highly digital settings or, or low resource settings, in order to actually produce a trusted certificate that can be used in a number of domestic and international use cases. Now, I won't go into the major technical details here, but the idea is that um, from an issuer in one country could be able to produce a vaccination certificate uh, represented here as a, as a, as a um, QR code on a mobile phone, but it could also be in a piece of paper. And through a global trusted framework, that certificate or, and its validation um, could be verified either domestically or internationally by another party. So again, this is a very uh, ambitious uh, undertaking, um, but the idea is not to use one specific solution, but to develop the overarching framework for a minimum data set, for standards for adoption use, uh, for ethics and, um, and other perspectives on the development certificate that will allow it to actually be used in cross-border situations, but also in a number of domestic situations as, as countries are opening up. Just to finish up, and I won't go uh, detailed into this slide, but there have been a number of very valuable lessons that we've learned through the pandemic. And I'll just target in on, on the issue of equity. Um, so in particular, what we've seen is that digital solutions um, aren't accessible to all uh, demographics of the population. And in some cases, we could even see that it's potentially exacerbating um, existing social inequities. Um, so we need to keep in mind that vulnerable population groups are often the least likely to access digital solutions, and we need to mitigate that through either alternative solutions or specific approaches with digital uh, technologies that allow for the greatest possible inclusion. We've also seen that digital skills of the workforce have been a, a, a shortcoming, um, given that many of the health systems have actually had to adjust in short period of time, um, and health workforce has obviously been under immense stress. Actually, them not having the appropriate digital skills has really hindered the uptake of some solutions which could provide a lot of value. And then just really to uh, also echo what Nick had said about the infodemic. So it's true that infodemic management has become um, a big part of uh, risk communication activities in countries. And really what we're seeing is that um, when it's applied effectively, it can really mitigate a lot of the uh, information which is false and misleading about uh, either vaccines or, or about uh, certain potential cures for COVID-19. So again, uh, a much more structured approach to how that type of information is, is handled and, and what we can do to ensure the validity of such information. I'll leave it there and of course, I'm very happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Clayton. Uh, I think you uh, brought the message home once again that the spectrum is very broad of the different opportunities uh, of uh, digital health applications and, this, and, and the use of um, the corresponding infrastructure. I think uh, this uh, ties very well with what we heard from the other speakers um, and also very clearly highlights, and especially on your last slide, all the challenges that are ahead, but also the opportunities that go with them. Um, I think uh, what we saw from all the, the different inputs that we had um, so far is this uh, broad spectrum um, of different options. And the question then is, we need to act rapidly, we need to modify, to do more research on how we can use it better, to modify the ways we recognize technology. So where would, should we focus first? And so perhaps this is a, a good point to introduce the poll results. Um, we asked you a question in the beginning, so I would pass to Erica uh, to show us the answers and perhaps reflect briefly on what they mean. Yes, um, Annalisa, do you want to go ahead and share? Okay, I think the main thing to say is that um, there was a lot of uh, support for really the full range of um, digital health tools particularly video conferencing for remote consultations, but really across the board. And this is um, something that uh, we probably need to reflect on sort of uh, moving forward with the questions that um, there's, I mean, given that the sample of people is people who are interested in attending a webinar on uh, digital health tools, but it shows that there is uh, quite a lot of meat here to um, to digest. Okay, so um, Dimi, would you like me to have a look at the chat box? Um, yes, um, yeah. I think this is a. I think I think we see Erica from the beginning of the webinar that there's been quite a bit of back and forth asking for information, and our speakers and other participants have provided links. So yes. I think. It would be useful for everyone to look at the chat box even if they're educating <laughs> themselves. But when it comes to actual questions, perhaps, or input for our speakers, please go ahead and let us know what's going on. Okay, so, um, yes, thank you. It's been a very, very busy and interactive uh, chat box, which is absolutely fantastic. Please do take a look because there are some really useful links there um, to other resources. Um, but one of the things that seems to be coming through quite strongly in the questions and with the questions that we received um, earlier is that pe people seem to be very interested in, in examples of good practice. So for the panel, are there any really good examples of best practice, but also how can we recognize good practice? So how can we assess the effectiveness, safety, security, usability, et cetera, of these digital tools and know that they are, uh, recognize them as good practices, which we then want to take forward into the um, future. And um, this is from our colleagues in, the, in Finland. Is there a need for standardization and regulation regarding health apps which are currently on the market? So just that to start off with, and then I've got to go dive back into the chat box and we'll do, hopefully do a second round. All right, so I think we pick up the first big area of questions, which is how do we know uh, what works essentially? And let's go back to our panel and perhaps start with our keynote speaker. Um, Nick, um, you have already uh, definitely a, a, a spectrum of thoughts on this. I know this from your work uh, that I have seen. So perhaps give us a couple of ideas. Uh, so, so there are two or three things. Um, the first thing to say is one of the best ways that we know if something works is that we is that we research it. And I know that sounds like special pleading from an academic to say more money for research, which is what every academic says, right? But um, what we've seen at the moment um, is a huge natural experiment um, in all sorts of different uh, solutions being tested. And if you look at the academic literature, you see just a, an incredible set of solutions being tested, all sorts of different specialties and innovators. And, and Alexander was talking about you know, innovation isn't just you know, in the state sector, it's all, you know, all sorts of different sectors. But my analogy with this is that it's a bit like an elastic band. We don't know if this is an elastic band which has been stretched and is just going to snap back to exactly how it was before, or if some of this is going to stay. And we don't know what we should want to keep. And so we now have a window in this giant natural experiment where we can assess that. And so one of the things that we really need to work on, I think, is how do we get some really 
quick, pragmatic evaluation built into this quickly in order to try and give us an evidence base to, uh, to understand better as we start to adapt what to keep and what not, because there are concerns about this. Um, it's not always the most, Nigel Ebert has made the point in the chat that uh, you know, when we talk about remote, con remote consultations, actually in the simplest and most used remote consultation is a phone and not video. So we might find that when we go and we test these things, actually we, we learn things about what technologies are most appropriate. And then the other thing to say is we have regulatory infrastructure at the moment, which is based around, uh, well, essentially around products and things that are fixed. And the thing about digital is the speed of the development of that product cycle is much quicker. And those products are in some instances inherently adapting in a different way. There is work to adapt those regulatory structures to, un to, to be able to treat you know, software as a medical device, to change those regulatory structures. But I think we, we need to have a broader conversation about how do we change our overall frameworks for understanding licensing and monitoring and evaluation of these very fast moving technologies and how do we start doing that during this very specific period of time. Thank you, Nick. I think this is uh, excellent um, as a perspective. If we have countries in the chat box asking, okay, but what can I do now? I mean, my country wants to um, work more on our contact tracing apps. Where, app, where should I look? So where should they look? I see Clayton nodding and perhaps we come to you first. Well, in terms of where we should look, I mean, um, there's been a lot of literature which has been produced um, and also specific guidelines by uh, the European Commission, for example, which have targeted on a rather specific technology. Um, there's also from an international perspective, for example, in the area of telehealth, a lot of standards that have actually been developed and published over a number of years. So um, while there isn't actually, I would say, kind of like a single one-stop shop for information, I think the information's out there. Um, but it very much um, is, is um, disparate in terms of what specific technology we're looking at. In terms of COVID-19 um, and specifically digital contact tracing apps, because that's the, the focus today. I mean, again, we found a lot of uh, very clear statements about data privacy from sort of the European Data Privacy Board, from the Association of Commu Computer Machinery and other very large bodies. So again, the information's out there. It's just sometimes a little bit difficult to, to grasp it. What I think has been um, very vivid is that the discussion about particularly privacy and usage of some of these apps um, has actually been very vivid in the, in the start of the pandemic. So a lot of discussions that perhaps would have taken uh, even a decade of being condensed into something like six months. So we've learned a lot in a short period of time. Um, there's been a lot of, I would say, Nick, uh, real world research. And I know that's, that's not the same, but there's been a lot of trial and error. Um, and a lot of success and failure that's come out of that. And I think if we can learn uh, from those failures, then, then that in itself is a, is a form of documentation moving on. So, so. I think most definitely what not to do is just as valuable as what to do uh, in those situations. Uh, Clayton, uh, Kerry, can I come to you? I think uh, from your experience and you already reflected uh, a little bit uh, in your presentation, where should colleagues look? right now and what do we do then moving forward yes i mean i think to a certain extent some of it has been said i completely agree with the previous speakers that we've been in a phase where you know necessity has been the mother of invention and we've been focusing on generating practice and i think there's got to be this critical phase coming soon um i hope when the pandemic um is tack is 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 fully responded to where we can really go through and think about what has been effective what hasn't been effective um, and in terms of actually generating practice, we have supported uh, um, the WHO and the ITU in uh, WHO based in Geneva to, to develop an, an M Health hub where we've generally proposed this as a place to kind of store practice of what's out there. So it's a spot to go and look and see what's available. It's not necessarily um, at this stage a spot to know what is, what is best practice. But I think on this, we have to build then indeed the framework for. Um, how to assess what works and what doesn't. Um, and I think it's not just, of course, we, we're looking at things both from the perspective of, you know, is this tool that will be used uh, at these 
could these become consumer tools or, or link to your you know, consumer products? Or are these tools which will ultimately, you know, be used within health and care systems, in which case a very, very specific kinds of legislation is exist and is being built on over the next nine months to incorporate more sort of AI based applications as well. Um, so I think it's also, and it's also in addition to the to the discussion around effectiveness and non-effectiveness and what's best practice, we'll have to also look at it from um, a population perspective and think about equity and who's getting access to these tools. So I think that's another another level that we'll have to bring in um, through through traditional techniques and uh, for for innovation into health and care systems. Thank you, Carrie. I think this is a vital point. Very often when we talk about effectiveness or success of a certain um, intervention, we look um, at clinical outcomes or we look at the, at the hard outcomes that we've set in advance and we neglect um, the issue of equity. And this is it's a really, truly important point uh, in this situation as in any other. Alex, can I come to you for a second and ask, is the Austrian experience a best practice example? Uh, I will uh, take the easy road and say yes and no, because it's not something I can answer in a, in a minute, I think. But if, if I may, I can share something. I think we, we, we learned or we see a lot also from the Austrian perspective and the colleagues in other countries might perceive something similar. I think it's a very interesting crunch time, as you call it, Dimi, I love that term for that also. Um, to see that the um, it's an interesting situation. We, health systems, we are uh, uh, we have a very elaborate and sophisticated evaluation culture, right? With the whole market access uh, regulation and the reimbursement decision making. The situation we see now with the digital health solutions in COVID and beyond is that the spectrum of innovators is broadening. So the people with potentially good ideas for the system are not those that are most knowledgeable in these sort of traditional methodological approaches. Uh, so we have to find a way of Finding out how we can can we help these actors in in uh, in evidence provision and in 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 meeting those standards. Now there is some interesting um, initiatives going on in in Germany on that, also with the Nice framework in the UK, etc. But especially for the smaller countries, this is a very interesting question. And also with regard to health apps, because that question came up, right? So what can be done at international level that helps sort of smaller systems in the decision making on what health app do we want in the system, what doesn't do, don't we want in the system? Um, and um, yeah, there, there is maybe also need for a sort of separate layers because there might be market actors looking at the German speaking market. So you can do something different for those, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so the broadening of spectrum of innovators is, is definitely something we, we, uh, we have to deal with. Okay, thank you. I think this is a, a crucial point. Um, we are now at a point where we have four minutes left. Uh, we, have, we pride ourselves in keep, about keeping in time with the webinar, so we try for it this week as well. Erica, I'll come briefly back to you to give us maybe one uh, glimpse, final glimpse into the chat box. Uh, what's the really predominant uh, topic other than people sharing input, and for that we're really grateful. Yeah, I mean, it's been uh, wonderful, the sort of like sharing of knowledge in the chat box, absolutely fantastic. It's like a full online learning experience. Um, but one of, the, one of the questions is, also follows on from what you said, is that... Um, Previously, we asked about good practice, but also I think we need to look at what not to do. And so uh, one of the questions was like, why did Norway drop their app um, and what did they do instead? So that was very much directed at Clayton because he mentioned it in his um, um, uh, presentation. But I think we can also broaden it out. Is there anything that you've come across where you feel that that's something that came up for, for COVID, it was tried, it didn't work, and it's something we could learn from as a negative, you know, as in sort of like, well, we don't need to try that again, okay? Perfect, okay. thank you, Erica. And I think uh, the way we're gonna do it, and I hope uh, the speakers are in agreement, we're gonna go through all of you once and end with Nick, who will also just give us a little bit of a reflection to wrap up in the last three minutes. And let's start with Kerry. Kerry, uh, you have a, a bird's eye view from the, from the European perspective. What do we learn from that didn't work so well? What didn't work so well? Um, I want to focus on the Norwegian case. <laughs> um, I think that the, um, I mean, I think, I think what I want to say about, about a situation like that is, is just the way in which this, uh, this exercise brought up um, these, these, in a very hard way, these issues of privacy and data protection. And, and alongside, uh, you know, a sense of very much, I think, from a population perspective, changing notions of risk, because suddenly they're in a, a pandemic uh, situation. Um, and I think, you know, I think 
what we knew that wouldn't work well, of course, was any imposition of a value, a set of values or, or you know, of this is the right, this is the, this is the way your population should think about the sort of uh, safety data protection ratio. This is where you should come down. And so, um, and I think, you know, for example, uh, it, understanding the comment, if, if Norway cho chose to, you know, to step out, it, it's because, you know, they, they, they wanted a different a different sort of way of dealing with the issue from a data protection and privacy issue for themselves and i think this was this was key to the success and and and, and all the way through the process um you know certainly from the european commission level we've been extremely mindful of these data protection data privacy issues and and very much you know listening to um you know, what is the advice to be in line with the frameworks but also politically how is it landing with people you know because uh, and, and it linked into, of course, a lot of the, the misinformation debates about the use of data. And uh, this isn't really, wasn't quite responding to your point, but I think the data, the, the Norway uh, issue brought it up. And, you know, this was a real-time experiment in where do we land as a society, on different societies and, and data protection and data privacy and, and its usefulness and, does use, and to what extent will usefulness outweigh considerations. And, and we could see at the European level this was different in different populations and even subpopulations. And um, I think this is going to be a, a very fascinating uh, topic on which to, 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 to work in, in coming months. And I hope that the academics among you will really be exploring this. But Kerry, I think it's very relevant to the question because I think it, it, it introduces this idea that there is a need for flexibility uh, in dealing with the fact that we, where we might have to land may not be where we thought we would have to land. So, and that's then a very important thing to understand both from the researcher perspective, but definitely also from the policymaker perspective. Um, if we go to Austria, um, Alexander, to you, and not necessarily only related to Austria because you're an expert at the international level as well, where do we, uh, what do we learn best from the things that maybe turned out different than we thought? I think uh, I, will, I will start in, in, in Austria and then, but maybe it's a bigger point. So what, what we learned and what worked quite well is that innov innovative approaches can come from anywhere, basically. So it was very surprising to see that, well, you had this, this NGO with this private market partner and the data protection experts uh, teaming up and, and pushing a, a solution that was sort of technically very state of the art and, and it was all out there. What was tricky, I guess, is getting something that's in the field so fast into a political communication that makes sense. And in, in the sort of innovation perspective, again, it, it showed that there is just simply still, at least in Austria and probably many other countries, no defined way from this sort of non-public sector innovations to come to the public sector and to make it sort of into the, the regular system. And, and this is something that the COVID-19 app is struggling with, but we see it with, with many health apps. Um, Clayton, over to you. Hmm. Well, I think, again, having agility in, um, and, and I would say to a limited extent, a kind of a, a risk appetite for trying uh, new solutions, particularly uh, in, in these times, I think has actually created many lessons learned um, that we can apply in other perspectives of, of digital uh, digital health implementation. So, you know, really what went wrong? Well, several things have gone wrong. And I actually, in, in, I'm an internal optimist, but I think that's actually quite positive um, that we can take what, what's been learned and, and move back into it. Again, I come back to the, the digital skills of the health workforce point, I, because I think it's, um, it's something that we really need to focus on in to, to ensure the sustainability of, of any digital health solutions going forward. Um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of animosity on behalf of, of healthcare professionals to adopting digital solutions. And now I could say that, well, they've actually, to some extent, seen a lot of the positive benefits. So there's been a mishmash. It hasn't actually worked very well in some cases. Um, but again, the very fact that many countries have tried and failed and tried and succeeded has been, again, a point that I'd like to reiterate as being a, a positive aspect coming out of it. So will we end up staying the same or as Nick puts the elastic snapping back again? I think there'll be a middle road. Um, I think some solutions will be discontinued, but I think um, the public's demand for a lot of uh, the convenience and uh, the critical importance of some solutions will actually be retained and we will see a, a fundamental transformation of health systems going forward. Over. Thank you, Clayton. The very nice bridge to Nick. Uh, Nick, over to you to wrap us up for today. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, and I think that, uh, and again, this sounds terribly self-serving, but I think that what this discussion illustrates is the advantage of a collaboration like the European Observatory, because actually 
in these times of uncertainty and when we're all experimenting, one of the best ways in which we can learn is by learning from each other and by in real time in really quick learning cycles, being able to not just experiment within our own systems, but being able to understand what is going on in other similar systems across Europe. And agencies like the World Health Organization and the European Commission are absolutely critical for that and leveraging that and creating European level infrastructure. But even just learning from the concrete experience of different countries is so important that it's going to be one of the really practical things that we can all do to help move forward through these issues. And then more broadly, I think the, the, the key thing is, and I, this isn't a new message for anyone who's been working in eHealth for many years, which is that this is an incredible technological opportunity and there's been technological solutions. But in the end, these are social and organizational and system processes. And if we are going to be able to move forward with things that not only work, but which have the trust and the confidence of the, the patients and citizens and the professionals and the regulators and the payers, then it's not just about the technical content of the solutions. It's also about the engagement and the process and the transparency and the trust that underpins that. Um, and so that's, that I think is the key thing that we need to do now is have what I love Kerry's expression of a more critical phase where we're more evaluative, but we need to pick up also on what Alexandra said, which is that you know, this is an innovation system which has a broader range of actors and stakeholders than maybe some of the other innovation systems within health and care. And as we move forward, we need to do, move forward in a way that involves all of those different stakeholders and does that in an evidence-based and transparent way. And hopefully, the observatory will continue to be part of sharing those experiences and bringing that to as many people as possible. Thank you. And with that, I think we can thank everyone for being here today. Our speakers, our participants, our colleagues uh, on the technical side of things, and hope that we see you again for the next webinar um, and that we keep the exchange uh, as lively and as positive uh, as it has been so far. Thank you all very, very much. Enjoy your Tuesday. Enjoy the rest of the week and see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.